Would you stand and join me in our call to worship? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Yes, no, maybe. For our prayer request this morning, I want to just share with you that we keep uh, Janie Fisher and her family in our prayers with the passing of her mom. Uh, just, it's not just that. They're packing up a household. They were getting ready to do that before she passed, and they were going to downsize. So um, she's had a funeral, and they're continuing to get her dad ready um, to, to move. So just, that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot to lose your spouse and your house. Um, where you and your spouse raised your kid. So some of you are at a place in your life where you can appreciate how difficult that is for everybody. Um, and the rest of you will just have to take my word for it. Um, Bill Cook has, uh, starts radiation therapy tomorrow, hopefully, to get rid of the cancer in his leg that does not seem to want to go away. The Collins family, Edna Collins uh, passed away, so the Collins family will be having her funeral. Um, at Memorial Gardens, which is out on the way to Dublin, it will be at 10.30. Everything will be outside, given where we are with COVID and everything. So um, it did not sound to me as though it were restricted to just family. So if I, I think if you showed up for the funeral, I don't think anybody would object. I just, I, I don't think they expect any, anybody is more to the point. I don't, but that doesn't mean you're not welcome. So just... Uh, just be aware that that is where the funeral will be. It will be at 10.30 uh, tomorrow morning. Um, Butch White was here looking real good this morning. And uh, Butch Reed, we remember him as well. Um, Mary and Dick and John and Thelma. Betty Turner, are you here again this week? She is. So I caught up with Betty after church last week, and, and Betty's doing well. And, uh, and the Lyme's disease is behaving itself, which is not always, and we are very thankful for that. So... Um, also, uh, Ella Taylor, which is the other grandmother, is uh, going in for a biopsy uh, tomorrow. And then Angela Lambert, who is a friend of Deborah Effler, um, she is battling COVID and pneumonia um, at the moment. And who grabbed me on the way in? That was Cheryl Loving, 
Um, she's got family who have, um, have COVID and the baby has, has COVID. So you all just would remember that. And Sylvia Lloyd, I'm working my way down the list. Sylvia's not here with us. She's not doing well. Um, but she joined us for Bible study Thursday night, so that was exciting. I miss, I miss Sylvia because when I talk about grammar, she's, she's the one who understands immediately um, about all that stuff that we all hoped we would have to forget after we had it in high school or suffered through it in freshman English in college and then hoped we would be able to pack it away and never have to, have to run into a past perfect tense again in our lives. So um, anyway, all right. Is there anything else? We all good? All set. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, shall we? We come to you this morning, O font of wisdom, seeking exactly that. Um, there have been times this week, O God, when we have not bent our knee, and we have not sought your way in your wisdom. We ask, most gracious God, that you would forgive us, and that when we have attempted to go our own way, you this morning, you this morning would give us the gift of your Holy Spirit, that it might rest upon us, and that it might give us the wisdom that we need for this week. It is so easy. It is so easy to follow the ways of the world. It is so easy to rant and to rave and to worry about all of those things. But uh, there is one needful thing. There is one needful thing. And as uh, Jesus told Martha, Mary has figured it out. So we may, may we be like Mary this week. May we kneel at the feet of Jesus. May we receive the wisdom that we need. And in this hour, with kneeled knees and raised hands, may we offer praise and thanksgiving um, that is fit, fit for a king. Hear us this morning, O God, as we lift up those who stand in need of our prayers. We think of uh, Janie Fisher and her family. We especially remember her dad, um, who has lost his wife and is getting ready to find a, a new place to live. Remember Bill Cook as he gets ready to go in for radiation therapy. Uh, and we think of the Edna Collins' family and ask that you would be with them as they prepare to say goodbye and experience life without her. We pray that you would be with uh, Angela Lambert. And we, of course, remember Butch and Butch and Mary and Dick and John and Thelma and ask that you would be with them. And we pray for Sylvia Lloyd that you would continue to have your hand upon her. We ask, most gracious God, that you would be with uh, Ella Taylor and ask that you would uh, have your hand upon her. It's an awful lot, oh God. And just let her know that she does not do this alone. But she has family, and she has friends, and she has a small army of people praying for her and lifting her up before the throne of grace. And this morning we pray for our soldiers in Afghanistan. We pray for the families of the 13 who will come home in boxes. And we ask that you would be with their families as they mourn this week. And we pray for the safety and security of our troops as they attempt evacuation over the next two days. We pray. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray for um, those who are trying to get them out of the country, uh, in which being Christian will carry a, a death sentence with it. We pray for the women and the children who will have to once again live under this regime. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that there are those there willing to lay down their lives for the sake of others. Keep them safe as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember me, remember me, O oh Lord, remember me. The interesting thing I was noticing about COVID this time around is last time we all stayed bundled up and isolated and it was hardly ever here and you didn't know anybody hardly who had it and um, this time around we're a little laxer with stuff um, but my goodness I was just thinking everybody I know just here in Radford um, 
that has come down with COVID and, and survived. And you're all here this morning because you've either survived or you haven't had it. And I thank God that you're here, and I thank God that you either survived it or you don't have it. Um, so as we pray for others, I hope you give God thanks every day for the health that he has graced you with and the recovery that he's given you. Um, so there is there's something to be thankful for, even in the midst of a pandemic. So be thankful this morning and receive the offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above He heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Most gracious and loving God, we ask that you bless both gift and giver, even as they have given, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, I'm glad to see my wife and embarrass her, because I picked the second hymn just for her. Yezu, Joy of Man's Desiring, number 644. that 
that fashion with its fire of life impassioned striving still to truth unknown soaring dying round thy throne through the way where hope is guiding hark what peaceful music Drink of joy from death and bring There is his beauty, fairest pleasure There's his wisdom's holiest treasure Thou dost You may be seated. It's never as good as just listening to Bach himself, but it's, that's the best I can do with the hymnal that we have, which is far better than anybody else's hymnal. I'll just tell you that. Been there, done that. Um, so I'm not sure what's going to happen when they finally get rid of the hymnal. That's, that's sitting out there waiting um, to see what happens to the denomination, whether we keep a hymnal, but the talk is they were going to get rid of it. So I'm not sure what they were replacing it with. I'm not sure they know, but ours isn't to worry about church bureaucrats. Um, our job is to worry about Jesus where we are, which is here at Central in Radford. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from 1 Kings, the third chapter, verses 7 through 14. 1 Kings, the third chapter, verses 7 through 14. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. This is Solomon speaking. Although I am only a little child, which does not mean he took the throne at 12. You may bump into a commentary that says that this is a euphemism. Um, he feels like he doesn't know anything when he's sitting there just walking into being a king over a country and standing in the presence of God. You too might feel just a little intimidated and a little bit... Uh, a little bit much like a child, so keep that in mind. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted, and that is your clue that Solomon says that the promise to Abraham is fulfilled, or at least he thinks it is. So um, those of you who went through the Susan Richter um, Epic of Eden thing, may, may remember that. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, that is not to let your enemies live, but we're talking just the opposite. Don't get confused but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. This morning I wanted to ask you if you could have one thing in this world, what would it be? Now I know you're all adults, and when you do this with a church, it's called missioning and visioning. If your church could be anything you wanted to be, what would, that, what would you do? If, if, 
And then somebody would say, oh, I think we should do this. And you go to write it on the whiteboard, and then somebody would say, oh, no, we can't do that. And it's like, no, 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 that's not the point. The point is, you are seven once again. You have not lived a life of limitations. You are seven once again. And somebody asks you, if you could have one thing in this world, what would it be? <coughs> if it were me... If it were me, I think my 57-year-old self would travel back to the year 1989. And I would sit down with myself and I would say, listen, you're about to go ask that Sue Georgie girl if you should go on a blind date with another woman. And I think that you should stop wasting time and you should just ask Sue Georgie out now. And save yourself 11 years of aggravation and separation and all kinds of other stuff. And you should just get it right the first time. That's what I would do. You're welcome. It's 11 long years, what can I say? I think if I were going to talk to myself, I'd go back to shortly after we were married. And i sit down with myself and I would say, I think you should not wait to adopt a child. I think you should do it now. Because the one thing none of those adults and parents out there are telling you is that raising a child is an endurance race. And you will get tired. And the younger you are when you start, the better off you will be when things get tough and long and tiring. Maybe that's not true. But I would certainly go back and give it a whack and see. Now, chances are that I wouldn't listen to myself because I didn't listen to anybody else when I was in my 20s. I'm not sure why I would listen to myself if I came back. But I think if it were me, at 57, I would want to go back and at least impart a little wisdom to the me from an earlier age. Because it might make life a little easier. And interestingly enough, I think that Solomon, son of King David, did exactly that. In a moment, he understood all that he did not understand. Let's try that one more time so you get there. In a moment, he understood all that he did not understand as a young man in his 20s. He had neither the time nor the conscience to live with regrets if he could prevent it. And so he comes to God and says, I want to not mess up, but in order to not mess up, I need wisdom beyond my years. Now understand, God offered him anything. Anything he wanted. Anything at all, and he chose a listening heart. Now I know, I know, what you're going to tell me is you all learned in Sunday school that Solomon received what from God? Wisdom. I had the same flannel graph that you did. And a little character walks up on the blue flannel graph, and you have the big cloud or whatever. was. And, and what would you like? I would like wisdom. The Hebrew, the Hebrew is literally a listening heart. And I want to stick with that this morning because I think that we have too many hearts in this world that do not listen. And you cannot be wise and you cannot be understanding until you listen. From the Greeks, we all learned how to split up our, our mind and our spirit and our body and our intellect and our emotions, and they just splintered everything away. The Hebrews did not understand that. So when they talk about a listening heart, they are talking about the seat of your emotions. How do you feel? My favorite question. What do you think? How do you think that's going to bear out on everybody in the long run? All of that stuff, the Hebrew wraps up into the word heart. So when you have the word a listening heart, we are talking about empathy. And outside of the fear of God, I want to suggest to you that empathy is the beginning of all wisdom. You must. You must be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and walk in them a bit and understand. Listen with your heart, if you will, before you can be truly wise. You have to have a heart 
that listens. And I will go to the mat for that. If you cannot place yourself in somebody else's shoes, if you cannot take the time to listen, then wisdom will never be yours. Which means I think that there's a whole line of, well, there are fools of plenty online. Can we say that? Is that okay? Is that good to say? People who do not listen? Lots of those. And Solomon says, I want a listening heart. And it's interesting when he chooses that, there are things that he doesn't choose. What is it that Solomon turns down? He turns down glory. Every king wants glory. Everyone wants fame. Do you not wish to live forever? And in the movie and, and the philosopher, they are not talking about eternal life. They are talking about fame and glory. Do you not want to be known as the very best at something, anything? When you walk into the room, everybody looks at you and goes, ooh, ooh, I want to be like him. I want to follow in her footsteps. But Solomon turned down glory. And he turned down to the armor of pride with its glitter and its gold. And instead, I like to believe that he chose the armor of God. Solomon turned down worldly success. Now, I know, I know what you're saying. He was the most successful king that there was. He was wealthier than anyone. His, there was more peace in his kingdom for a longer period of time than any other king of Israel. I know that. But he was successful because he let God create that success rather than his own pride. Do you understand? He bowed first at the altar of God, and then God gave him those things. He did not take them with glory and pride and war. And there's a difference. The other thing was is that Solomon did not request riches. Now, the Psalms are full of references of great kings gaining great riches. And there is no question that Solomon was rich. He was, in fact, the wealthiest monarch of Israel and maybe of his day. But his wealth, his wealth came from his treasure that was stored up in heaven, not the oppression of his people and the subjugation of foreign peoples. And Solomon gave up seeking the death of all who opposed him, or so it says. And this isn't the time. For those of you familiar with the story of Solomon, I know that you're all sitting there thinking to me, well, doesn't Solomon go on a campaign right after this to eliminate his entire opposition, and there isn't anybody left living who opposed him? And I said, yes. So you and I can discuss that some other time in my office. But for this morning, let me just say after a complex explanation, vengeance does not mix well with a listening heart. And maybe, maybe you can't listen at all if revenge is at the top of your list. Solomon's choice, Solomon's choice was a listening heart. And Solomon's choice would look much like the kingship that Moses wrote about in the book of Deuteronomy. Isn't it funny that it always comes back to Deuteronomy, that suzerainty treaty, and you all thought after you got done with Epic of Eden, I would never mention the suzerain treaty again. But those of you who remember the suzerain treaty, you remember that there is a king, a king who conquers. So when God comes to you and makes a covenant and a promise, and you think it's about negotiation, you are wrong. The treaty, my friends, is the terms of your surrender. So the treaty in Deuteronomy are the terms of every king's surrender. The king of Israel, according to Deuteronomy, is not the ruler of Israel. It is God Almighty in heaven who is the ruler of Israel, and the king of Israel is his vassal, his servant, his little feudal whatever they are that run around. You know, he's, a, he's the big king without all the dukes and earls floating around him. And the goal... The goal of a good king in Deuteronomy is the welfare of its people, not the glory of the king. I'm in Deuteronomy 17 if you're trying to hunt that down and find that. 
And in order to govern, literally judge the people, the servant king needs the one thing that Solomon asks for. Right? If the people are going to be your top concern, then you have to be able to listen. You need a listening heart. And the text will go on to tell us that a listening heart shows itself in four ways, verses 9 and 11. It shows that it has an understanding mind. The listening ear will always help you understand a situation, the context in which it is born, the complex web of relationships that are around it. A listening heart will know good from evil. It'll know the difference between the ways of God and the ways of the world. And a listening heart will understand what is right so it will be able to hear and judge rightly. And a listening heart will have a wise and discerning mind. Wisdom, wisdom or the listening heart is often more closely associated with the skill of the woodcutter. The word for wisdom that we use here comes to us mostly from the book of Exodus. And at the very end of the book of Exodus, after the Cecil B. DeMille film ends, and we leave Moses on the top of the mountain, the book of Exodus actually ends someplace else. And you, of course, get brownie points if you remember where the book of Exodus ends and what is happening at the end of the book of Exodus. Cecil B. DeMille got it wrong, and Disney got it even wronger. Because Disney ends the Prince of Egypt crossing the Red Sea. Cecil B. DeMille ends the whole thing pretty much just after the giving of the Ten Commandments, hence the name of the film. The book of Exodus in the Bible ends with the building of the tabernacle. It ends with God coming to dwell with his holy people. And Moses puts out a call and says, any of you who have any gifts or talents, come on down, the price is right. And there they are. And they bring all of their cloth and all of their jewels and all of their gold. And there is someone in there who with wisdom saws the wood, with wisdom melts down all the gold. With wisdom creates all of that gilded furniture that goes into the tabernacle. With wisdom. I dabbled in woodworking for a while. And you will never see anything I made show up at a craft show. Okay? Mostly what I made was a lot of sawdust and a lot of wood shavings. And when somebody asked, well, how come you don't work in metal? And it's like, well, because I can't sand my mistakes away with metal. But boy, I tell you, they'll go right away pretty much with wood. Granted, the dimensions won't be the same when I get done. They'll probably be a good three-quarters of an inch smaller. But hey, hey, you just keep sanding everything down until it all goes away. I can, I can explain to you about a dovetail joint. I might even be able to make one, maybe. I can explain to you about where you should glue and where you shouldn't glue because the, the wood's going to expand and contract and do all that stuff, and I can make a lovely wastebasket. I really can. But then you go to a craft show and you look at some of this stuff. Okay? I have a box sitting in my study that Dick Heldreth made for the Sunday school. It's gorgeous. Oh my gosh, it's got inlaid brass pieces and cards that are all laminated. It's, it's, it's a work of art. See, you understand, because your husband does this. There's jewelry makers and there's not jewelry makers. There's people who can do it. And then there's the people who put it together and you get done and you go, ooh. And that's, that's the biblical concept of wisdom. It's, it's more like, like music. Because I know I have a couple of musicians here. And you can sing the notes. You can sing the notes. We're fans of the voice, and there are lots of people who sing the notes. Well, there are some people who can't sing the notes, but we get rid of them pretty quick. And uh, then you get somebody who shows up on the stage, and they catch the spirit of the song. And when you hear that, you want to go, turn, 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 because they have wisdom, right? 
when they put that music together in its final form. When you're sitting in the choir and you're performing that piece and all of a sudden that chill goes down your spine and yet I always talk about that as you finally made music. You weren't just singing the notes, but everything kind of comes together. And there is a moment when the director and the choir and everybody comes together and you get chills down your spine. And that's music. And that's wisdom. Now, I know that we live in a culture that values PhDs and MAs and MDivs and all that kind of stuff. But the Bible looks at it a little more holistically. That wisdom is, is knowledge applied that creates things that are beautiful and craftsmen. Right, Bill? Have I got it right? Yeah, just checking. Checking with the resident woodworker. That is the wisdom of God. It's not just getting the right answers. There is craft and art involved. And to do that, you have to listen. So Solomon chose the listening heart. And it was a heart not just filled with facts and figures, but the ability to apply them by listening to the people and circumstances around him. As I close this morning, I want to remind you that Jesus has become our wisdom. Everybody understand that? When Jesus came to the earth and the plan of salvation works something like this, that one righteous, perfect man should go and die for everybody else who's corrupt and can't get it together and is broken. Well, who made that plan up? Why should the guy who's got it all together die for everybody else when they can't get their stuff together? Who made that plan? Well, that'd be God. That'd be God. Nowhere else in the world do you see wisdom like that applied. Nowhere else. And we don't talk enough about that, I think, in church, because there are implications. We are founded by grace, right? Jesus died for us, and then he gave us the credit that he had accrued for us by grace. It's a gift. Anybody here earn that? If you are, we need to talk, okay? You don't earn it. It's just given to you. Freely, it's given to you. We are in a relationship with a God who gives freely all the time. And the problem we have in American religion is you get saved and you give the credit to Jesus and it's a free gift and then we spend the rest of our lives pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps trying to fix our sin as best we can and trying to figure things out as best we can. That's not the wisdom of God. If Jesus is our wisdom, then doesn't that follow That when you fall on your knees and the Holy Spirit comes to you in prayer, God will give you the wisdom, the wisdom that you so desperately need. Just give it to you. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Where's the PhD and the MA and the whatever? Where, where, where are the degrees? Makes you wonder why you spent seven years in higher education. If the first thing you got to learn is to get on your knees and let Jesus fill you with the wisdom. Because what you need, right, is a listening heart. And that comes from Jesus, and only from Jesus. It begins in the moment of our salvation. And it unfolds. It unfolds every time we kneel at the throne of God and ask. Ask for the wisdom of God. It is a journey. It is a journey that only the wisest will take. So this morning I want you to listen. I want you to listen with your heart. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn. You can come on up and help if you want. I've forced my wife to help us.
I didn't mark the page, David. What page is it on? 2235. All right, we're going to do this the best we can. And I hope you have some fun with it because it's just, it's just way too much fun. Go ahead and stand up. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing. Oh, we are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing. Oh, we are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing. Oh, we are singing for the Lord is our light. We are singing. Oh, we are singing for the Lord is our light. One of these days, we're going to do the Zulu. It's a... Oh, you were ready to teach it to him? Uh, next time. Um, how, how, how do the words go in Zulu? It's... Um, See a hamba, kukunani quinkos. See a hamba, kukunani quinkos. How easy is that? You can do that. Next time we sing it, we're going to do the Zulu. All right? May you go this morning. May you go into the quietness of your soul when your wisdom runs out. When you don't know what to do and where to go, may you go. In the quietness of the soul, may the Spirit of God, may the Spirit of God rest on you and come to your listening heart that you may have the wisdom of the ages brought into your very lives. In the name of Jesus, who is our wisdom, God the Father, who provided the way, and the Holy Spirit, who is the delivery guy. Amen.